Today we're going to continue to talk on topic of worship as we go into the series of true, true worship. And uh, I, love, uh, I love talking about this subject and it's, this subject is very dear to my heart because it, 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 through this I've, uh, I've learned a lot and I've grown a lot with God and my personal relationship with God as well as I've seen what worship is able to do in my personal life and the life of people. How many of you love worshiping God and just spending time in His presence? Come on. There's no better place to be than in the presence of God. This is, worship changes us more than, we benefit from worship sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, more than even God benefits from us. God loves when we come, we adore Him and thank, give Him thanks and we honor Him. But when He comes with His presence, He, he begins to change us. He begins to move uh, things within us. He begins to cleanse us. He begins to purify. He begins to rebuild us. And many times we end up benefiting more from it than God benefiting Himself, right? As Pastor Vlad said last, uh, last few Sundays, this phrase said that worship is a gift. It's the only gift we can bring to God that He hasn't given it to us Himself. Think about it. Everything you have in your life, everything I have in my life, the family, the friends, the ability to walk with two feet, the ability to see, the ability to hear, the ability to function in our body, an ability to breathe, an ability to perceive the world through our eyes, uh, every, all the giftings that we have on inside of us, all the talents that God placed on, uh, on, in all of us, everything that we do have in this world is given by God to us. The money that we work for, you know, that's why, that's why tithing is not called giving to God. It's called bringing back to God. Because He's given us the strength in the first place to make that money. Everything in our life, we don't give it to God. We really just bring it back. We return it. But there's one gift that you can give God today that He Himself has not given to you. And that's worship. And that's adoration. And that's thanksgiving. That's praise. That's pouring your heart out in adoration and acknowledgement of who He is and what He has done in your life. That's the gift God is seeking today. You know, all of us are seeking God. All of us are in pursuit of God. We say many times when we see God through prayer, we see God through worship, we see God through reading of Scripture. How many God seekers do we have in this house? And all of us... You know, honestly, even if you are not even a Christian, you see God. You just might not know which God you're seeking. People all around the world, every civilization that was discovered, every new tribe that was discovered, every time new, uh, uh, new civilization was discovered, they was always discovered that they worshipped something or someone. It's a, it's a need within us. It's what we were born to do. Worship is... It's, it's a big part of us. It's how we connect with God and we can't escape it. We can just choose who to worship. You know, we were born to worship. And, uh, you know, I have little kids and anytime the music comes on and they just, they just start dancing, dancing they just start shaking, they just move, uh, they just start moving, they start singing without even knowing words. It's, it's just... Who we are, who we were born to, uh, to do. It's what we were born to do. Actually, I do have a, a, a few clips, a few, few second clips if you can, if you can just play it. That's this morning. She was getting her worship on. We were born to worship. Come on, let's put our hands together for God. We, we are born to worship God. We just choose who we worship and how we worship. And Pastor Vlad covered many different uh, subjects in many, many different ways. Uh, how, how we worship and what it means to worship. And I just want to take it just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit further today. And talk about, uh, about, talk about a few things. Worship is simply recognizing God. Worship is simply acknowledging who God is. It's simply coming with the heart of thanksgiving and dependence on Him. That's all really what the worship is about. 
It's not necessarily about the words that we say. Because many times we say the words but we don't mean them. Worship is not about, uh, it's not about clapping or dancing or shouting. Even though that's a part of worship. That's the way we express our worship. But worship comes down to acknowledging who God is. Acknowledging Him. Recognizing Him. And thanking Him for who He is. For what He has done. How many of us have gone to the place to the party, to the church, to, hopefully it's not this church, uh, to some kind of a gathering. You came in and nobody noticed you. you nobody said hi to you. Nobody shook your hand. Uh, nobody introduced uh, themselves to you. It's kind of a, if you're more outgoing person, you're, uh, if you're like my wife, that she's going to go and she introduces herself to everybody. If you're like me, I'm more kind of introvert. I come in there and I'm like, mm, yeah, I don't know who you are. I don't, you know, um, um, and so, but how many, how many of you felt really comfortable and liked the place, to be in a place where you're not acknowledged? I mean, I don't know about you, like anytime I find myself in a situation and the moment the meeting is done, the moment the gathering is done, whatever the gathering, whether Christian, not Christian, whatever, and, and, and I don't know people and nobody acknowledges me, nobody says hi, nobody to you, I'm looking for the exit sign. I'm looking, where's the door? I'm out of here. And you know, in those moments, 30 seconds seems like 30 minutes. Because, you know, when you're in an awkward situation, when you're in a no man's land, you just, that's what worship is about. Worship is acknowledging God in our life, in our space, in our heart. Acknowledging that it is by Him that we're sustained. It is by Him that we have our being. It is by Him that we have made it this far. If it wouldn't be for Him, I wouldn't be here today that's what worship is really about it's about lifting a hand and say thank you Jesus for saving me thank you Jesus for this day it's about carrying the attitude of gratitude attitude of thanksgiving and worship amen everybody likes to be acknowledged we created an image and likeness of God and God likes when we're acknowledged so next time you get into prayer next time you get into worship don't rush to say things that you don't mean don't rush to say words that that, that you don't mean first acknowledge him Acknowledge him that he's here in this place. Acknowledge his greatness. Acknowledge his magnitude. You know, there's a scripture in the psalm that says, magnify the Lord. It's not that God needs to be magnified because he's so little. He's a little ant like crawling there and you just want to see bigger and you just take the magnifying glass and, you know, he's insignificant. No, what a lot of times happens is that God does things in our life. God brings blessings. God does many things in our life. But what happens throughout life, we kind of go on and forget. And we actually sometimes even start complaining. Like Israelites in a desert. They're eating heavenly bread. They're guided by this pillar of, uh, the pillar of cloud and pillar of, of, of fire by night. I mean, come on, this is supernatural. You think like, how in the world can you complain in that moment? But a lot of times our hearts get dull. We forget the goodness of God. We forget what he's done and he's doing. That's why David calls upon us. He says, magnify the Lord. Not that he needs to be magnified. But in our minds, it's growing dim. It's growing little. We begin to mur murmur and complain. That's why David calls to magnify the Lord. We're talking about worship. Um, worship is an attitude and action. Many times people come to, to church or come up to me or talk to the pastors or say, you know, I, I, you guys are a bit crazy, you know, I, I, I'm not sure about this whole thing. I worship God in, in my heart. And it's good. Definitely we have to have heart involved in our worship. But worship is not just about heart and just about thought. Yes, our heart has to be connected and our mind has to be connected to what we're doing. But worship is also an action. Throughout the Bible we'll see, we see that worship, um, worship involves a physical expression and we can read some of the physical expression the Bible covers. It says, among the physical expression of worship found in scripture are kneeling, clapping hands, raising hands, verbalizing praise, singing hymns and psalms, weeping, laughing, bearing witness aloud like saying a man, praise God, reading the word aloud, prostrating before the Lord, speaking in tongues, dancing before the Lord, giving public testimony, standing uh, silence and spiritual songs. If you noticed, all of those things had to do with action. 
everywhere throughout the Bible, uh, God calls us to act as a sign of worship. So next time we get together, feel free to dance. Feel free to, cut, to clap. Feel free to, to, uh, to get loose and just, just thank God. Not to care about what your neighbor is thinking. Not to care about who's standing beside me. And most importantly, to forget about the issues, the things that you're going through and focus on God. Amen, church? In, uh, in Rom, uh, Romans 12 verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Notice that Apostle Paul says, offer your bodies. Not your heart and emotion and your thoughts. But your bodies. A body has to be involved when we worship. Especially when we get together in corporate uh, settings. We have to go all out. Your heart, your mind, your body, your voice, everything has to go, out, go, all, go all out. You have to leave the altar of worship knowing that you left 100%. How many times, how many of you can say that, you know, today I left 100% during the worship altar. Don't raise your hands. I don't want you to be lying. <laughs> but in reality, if we examine ourselves, do we feel like, when worship comes and the altar is open, I'm not speaking of physical altar, I'm, I'm talking about worship as a living sacrifice. Do we give ourselves to God? And that also includes in our private time with God. That also includes when we're driving in the car and there's nobody around, we could listen to some worship and we can praise God and pray and we can lift Him up and we can begin to build ourselves. Or are we just doing nothing or doing nonsense or listening to nonsense? We have to be a people that build a platform of worship for God. Amen. I want you to go in the scripture and we, I'm going to give you a few points from that scripture and we will, um, we will take a few, few nuggets for ourselves from there. Uh, as Isaiah chapter 6 and we're going to read first eight uh, verses. We're just going to break it down. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 goes like this. In the, king that, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphims, each with six wings. Two, with two wings they covered their face, with two covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke and the whole earth is full of His glory. Here prophet Isaiah, he finds himself in a great atmosphere of worship. Prophet Isaiah finds himself through this vision at the throne of God where there is great worship. I want you to know this first thing is that there is no whining or complaining around the throne of God. I want you to notice that in heavenly atmosphere there is worship, there is adoration, there is acknowledgement of who God is. And if we want to live in our life, if we want to recreate the heavenly atmosphere in our families, in our lives, in, in, in our marriages, in our, our, our place, uh, of work in our place of business we got to live a lifestyle of worship that simply means a lifestyle of acknowledging God a, a lifestyle of worshiping God of expressing our love towards him expressing our thanksgiving expressing our gra gratitude that means not to live a life of complaining and whining but whether going through life constantly being grateful and acknowledging God in your situation amen church I want you to notice first thing that worship does. First, worship makes you look upward. The first thing that, has, that he, uh, sorry, prophet Isaiah, he begins to do is he starts looking up to the throne of God. When you get into a, when you begin to worship God, first thing that you have to do is you have to lift your eyes up. 
don't begin to start digging in your life in your situation don't be stuck in that mud and the problems in the chaos of your life don't be stuck in a confusion and just the even the busyness of your life you have to you have to lift your eyes up and see the king of glory you have to lift your eyes up and despite of your situation despite of what you're going through you have to begin to acknowledge him and honor him you have to begin to cry out holy you have to begin to cry out worthy the first thing that worship must do in in you when you begin to worship is to lift your gaze up not away from yourself away from your situation and away from your troubles and problems and focus on who God is I promise you one thing the moment you're going to begin to focus on God the moment you're going to begin to focus on his greatness the moment you're going to begin to focus on his power and his might the lesser and the smaller the problems and situations and the, and the things you're facing will become because worship is kind of like the airplane when you get on an airplane and it takes off the things that seem big, the, the things that, that seem uh, uh, un, uh, big and un, uh, you, you will not be able to overcome them. As you begin to elevate, it's not that they disappear and they become smaller. It's your perspective begins to change. Your paradigm shifts. Your vintage point changes. And when you, when you, and when you look at those buildings, when you look at those uh, roadblocks and those obstacles, they seem small. Not that they are gone. It's just because you begin to look upward. It's because, you, be, because you, you begin to move upward. When in our worship, you have to start with acknowledging God. You have to start with worshiping God. You have to start focusing on who He is, what He has done, what He is doing, and how great He is. We have to, like uh, David says in the psalm, have to begin to magnify Him. And the moment you begin to magnify God, automatically other things begin to look smaller just like they are come on church it's not always easy especially when you're going through things to look upwards that's why David and in his psalm says I look up to the hills where my help comes from when you look up you're knowing that yeah, I might be going through these things today, but I know the one who can help me go through it. I might be stuck in this place today, but I know through my worship, as I begin to cater to his presence, as I begin to worship him, as I begin to uplift him, as I begin to usher him, the things, he can, when he comes, he can bring a solution to it. He can take me out. When we shift our focus from our mess to our master, the master can begin to take the mess and shape in something beautiful. He can begin to take the, the things that we're struggling. He can take those, those scars of ours, that, that, the hurt that we've gone through. He can turn into a testimony. He can turn into stars. He can take the mess and turn it into a, a, a testimony. He can, in worship, when we begin to worship God as God, then he can help us go through the rest of the things. Amen, church? In a story, when King Je Jehoshaphat was facing an overwhelming odds against him, and the armies that came against him were numerous, and that he, had, he didn't stand a chance. Everybody knew it. He knew it. The other people were already rejoicing for the victory because they knew they were going to crush him. There were nobody in their eyes. But one thing that they didn't count on, they, they, they didn't count on worship. And that's something that King Jehoshaphat said, you know what? We are done. We are in trouble. We can't get out of this. So if we're going to go out, let me go out with worship. If, if, I'm gonna, if we're going to be destroyed, let me be destroyed with thanksgiving on my lips. Let me be destroyed with praises on my lips. He knew the secret though. He knew that there's no way God's gonna let him lose that battle if God is for, on the, front, uh, on the uh, front of it. And so we see that uh, God, as they were worshiping, as they were praising, God caused a huge confusion in enemy's camp. They start killing each other and they came out of that problem. A, a, a woman from the New Testament, a woman that had a daughter severely possessed, 
She was crying out to Jesus, says, Jesus, please help me. Jesus, please help me. Disciples already got annoyed and said, Jesus, can't you hear that she's annoying us? Just do something. Not, not even for the sake of compassion, but she just will not leave us alone. And she kept pressing through. She kept asking. And when she saw that asking is not doing any good for her, she ran ahead of them. She bowed and worshipped. Jesus couldn't overstep worship her. Jesus could not step over worship her. I don't know what you're facing today with. I don't know what struggles you're going through. I don't know what family issues you, you, you're, you're facing with. I don't know what situ financial situation you're going through or marital situation you're facing or health thing. But I know one thing for sure. God can't step over a worshiper. We see that many times in the Bible where worship opened a doorway to a supernatural change. Amen church. How many of us will be worshipers? Second thing, worship helps us to look inward. Worship helps us to look inward. What that means is in, in, in the light of His worthiness, we begin to see how unworthy we are. In the light of His greatness, in the light of His magnificence, we begin to see how insignificant we are. You know, sometimes we think too much of ourselves. It's true. Many times we think too much of ourselves. Many times we rely too much on our own strength. Many times we just think we've achieved something or we've got something going. But when you get into the presence of God and you realize that you are sustained by His breath. When you realize that you have what you have because He gave it to you. When you realize that I was no more than a miry clay and he plucked me out of it and he put my feet on a, on a steadfast rock and today I am here where I am at. When you begin to look inward and begin to see what he has done for your life. You, when you begin to focus on, on, on why are you grateful, what he has done. See first when you start looking upward you begin to see the greatness of God, the magnificence of God, who He is as in general, the creation that He, that, 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 the, that he created, the, the, the universe, the stars, just His, his overall power and, and, and uh, uh, glory. But when you begin to look inward, you begin to realize how much you need Him. And out of that place, you begin to worship. Out of that place, you begin to draw closer to Him because you begin to understand that you're dependent on God and this is the best place this is the best soil where God can begin to work with us see because when you begin to, to realize that you're dependent on God you surrender to him and a surrendered vessel is the best kind of vessel that he can use a surrendered vessel is a vessel where he can begin to shape and mold and, and make it as, as, as pleasing to him worship helps us to focus uh, helps us to see inward and realize how much we need God. And the third thing, before I go to a third uh, to a third point, in Revelation chapter four eleven it says, "They lay down their crowns before the throne and said, You are worthy, O Lord, and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, in, and by your will they are created." and have their beings. See when you realize, when you look inward during worship and you realize that you're dependent on God, what, what, what begins, begins to happen next is you begin to lay down your crowns. What does that mean? That means you begin to lay down all of your achievements. You want to escape pride? Worship. Because during worship you lay down your crowns. You see you take your true position in God. You see exactly where God is and where you are in relation to Him. And that's a, a proper place. This is a place where God can begin to work with you. See, when you, when you worship, you look towards God. You magnify Him. You exalt Him. When you worship, it helps you to look inward. You begin to realize how dependent on you on Him. You begin to surrender. The third thing begins to take place is worship empowers you to go forward. 
worship empowers you to go forward and um, verse 8 then I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us and I said here I am send me see when you find yourself in that atmosphere of worship when you live a lifestyle of worship through worship you will be empowered to say God I'm ready to do your will I'm ready to go where you send me God I'm ready to do what you ask me to do I'm ready to surrender these things I'm ready to to take on and take take risk I'm ready to walk by faith because I've surrendered it all worship empowers us to go forward in the story of three Hebrew boys Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego they they were facing with a big problem actually a life or death problem the king of Nebuchadnezzar he built this golden statue and he said that everybody at the sound of the instruments everybody has to bow to the statue and worship it and they found that these three Hebrew boys they did not worship so the king got angry he brought them in he explained to them once again said Lix, listen I like you guys you are my uh they were head of his departments they were uh ministers of different departments he said look I like you guys you're doing a great job for me and all but listen I've I've built this statue I put a lot of money into it a lot of gold and I want you to bow to it and worship to uh, worship it and if you don't I'm gonna kill you that was straight up like that and they said king I'm sorry but we won't be bowing down and we won't be worshiping it so he got even more angry he said I will the the fire pit will be seven times hotter and if you don't do it I will kill you and they said this is that listen king we don't worship any other God but our God see a person that just cops in uh, once on Sunday worship and just lifts their hands once in a while and sings a song once in a while those kind of worshipers they won't be able to say these kind of things those worshipers won't be say won't be able to say I mean come on it's just a few bows few seconds it's okay who knows in my heart I worship God but this is you know uh, God will forgive me see they it wasn't that kind of worshiper it was a true worshiper a worshiper that lived a worship style in a private time with God and say you know what I will not exchange my worship for anything and I will not give up my worship to anyone because worship belongs only to my God and only to my King and what happened next they said listen even if we have to die but we will not worship any other God then the King commanded the guards to take them bind them these three Hebrew boys and toss them into the fire the, 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 the thing is that the people that were carrying them to toss them into the fire pit they died but these three Hebrew boys they survived the fire couple things happened their bondages were broken and they were seen walking with Jesus when we worship I don't care what bondage you have in your life I don't know what you're carrying in your life I don't care what kind of what kind of struggles you're going through but I know one thing when you get into the presence of God these things begin to melt away they might not come off first time second time third time but the closer you get to the fire of God the further you press in through worship into his presence those bondages will be broken those things will be burnt and that fire will consume every demonic bondage and shame worship looses you to move forward worship opens a way for you forward and it doesn't end there when a king begin to look and see what's going on what's happening in the fire pit didn't we throw three men now why is there four Jesus was with them he says call them back out and when they came out he said your God is a true God and he said he written a law and said if anybody says anything against your God or you will be destroyed and their family will be destroyed and their house will be brought down to the ruins even down to the foundation because when you true truly worship God you live a lifestyle of worship when you truly live a, a, a lifestyle where you acknowledge God where, where you always exalt him in your life the problem sooner or later will crumble down and you will have a platform to move forward you have you will have a platform 
to show God's greatness and God's goodness in your life. And not only they were spared, not only their life were promoted, but the whole kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar ruled over, the whole Babylonian kingdom heard of the name of God. And nobody dared to say or mock the name of God. That's what true worship unlocks. That's what true worship does. When we live a lifestyle of worship, it opens a platform. It opens a way for us to bring the gospel into even the most stubbornest corners of the earth. Next thing, one thing that worship does, one thing I want you to notice is that through all, all throughout the Bible, and I can, I have tons of scriptures to tell you, but because of time, everywhere where you see worship in the Bible, it's almost always, 95% of the time, was tied to the miracle. All, look through every story where there was worship. It was always tied to the miracle. We see a, a story of Jericho. When they begin to shout and worship God, the walls fell down supernaturally. We begin to see uh, all, the, all the prophets of old. Most of them, they won't prophesy until a psalmist or, or a musician would come and begin to play for them and worship and create an atmosphere and then they will begin to prophesy and the things that they prophesied came to pass. We see in a New Testament, we see in the Old Testament Solomon's temple when they were making sacrifices and when they worshiped God, when Levites were worshiping, the glory of God came in a temple so strong that people couldn't even stand. It was physical, it was tangible, people could actually even see it because there was true worship and surrender. King Solomon received his blessing in his life because he was spending time in prayer and worship. David as a man known after God's heart, I'm a hundred percent certain he found favor in God's eyes not because he was the most righteous and the most holy God, guy but he was a worshiper. Despite of everything in his life, he always worshiped God. Today we read his Psalms. Every situation he met with worship. That's why God blessed him, blessed his descendants. He, he will come to sit on his throne because David built a legacy through a lifestyle of worship. Thank you for watching this content. I hope this was a blessing to you. If you're like me and you like to click on things, click on this, subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.